Leo Mayorovich, founder and CEO of Graphistry. Welcome back to the Data Exchange Podcast. Thanks, Ben. It's uh, only been a couple months, but it's felt like a, like a year or two. And uh, again, full disclosure, I am an advisor to Graphistry. So I have Leo here because we just wrote a well-received uh, post that I will link to in the episode notes entitled, What is Graph Intelligence? So first, uh, and we will go over so the, some of the key uh, observations in this post, as well as get some updates from Leo, because it's been uh, about a month and a half or a couple of months since this post got published. And uh, Leo is uh, uh, on the ground, so, so they say, in the, in the uh, graph intelligence space. So first, uh, why did we decide to write this post? So I can speak from my perspective. It was the chart around the rise of graph neural networks. So, so uh, by way of background for our audience, I was kind of interested in graphs very early on in the rise of data science and big data. I don't know if any of you remember, but some of the early tools in the data science world were things like GraphLab, GraphX, things like that. So graphs were kind of a topical back in those early days, but then the, it kind of fell off my radar and the radar of a bunch of data scientists. But then lately, I, there's been all these articles about graph neural networks. And then I saw this, I produced this chart of the rise of the number of papers of graph neural networks. So I said, it's time to uh, get together with Leo and figure out what's happening. So, so you've been in this space nonstop, probably for the last five, six years. So um, it's there, yes. do you detect a, a real kind of change in kind of uh, interest, level of interest and engagement? Yeah, um, so the post talks a bit about the academic side, but you know, we're really out like in industry with governments um, kind of really doing the actual stuff. Um, not, you know, but like the stuff that, pe that people see every day. and. I, I think my favorite anecdote here is uh, about right, right at the beginning of COVID, um, we were holding our annual um, kind of graph the planet graph workshop. And we had a bunch of chief data scientists from a bunch of companies. Um, and I asked each one if they did, um, how do they feel about graph neural networks? Because they're all graph people. And then uh, the academics all raised their hand and then all the industry people were silent. Then uh, flip it around, and now um, I'm LinkedIn. I'm seeing <laughs> almost every single one of those uh, uh, chief data scientists having posts on graph neural networks. So it's it's been a, a, a light switch, uh, a light switch flipping. So so insight number one, uh, courtesy of Leo in our post, is that uh, all companies already have data for graphs, and and then accompanying that is there are tools to turn those that data into graphs. So. Elaborate, Leo. Yeah, so before, um, when early on, um, and we actually still have projects like this, but it's, it's, it's really early on, um, like when we said graph, people thought graph database, we'll, we'll get into that later, but um, it was really became these massive ETL projects where you had to turn tables into graphs. You had to like, what is a graph? And then structuring in and could you query it and all that stuff, um, but uh, now nowadays and, and like they didn't even know what they're doing in there like are, are we looking out for relationships between people and communications things like that um but nowadays uh kind of like how you have data science notebooks where you can just load in a csv or connect to snowflake or whatever and you can just start actually directly go straight to go and do the data science um we're seeing that uh, the the graph ecosystem is part of that so now you can kind of skip a lot of that stuff um and i think that'll be important later in the conversation but um, basically, you can just kind of go ahead now. A lot, a lot of the tools are, are in place, which before there weren't. Um, and I guess we'll get into this later, but I think academia actually uh, has a lot to, we have a lot to thank for them there too. So in our post, we make the distinction between graph analytics and intelligence versus graph machine learning, which includes graph neural networks. So on the graph uh, uh, analytics, graph visual analytics side, um, how accessible are the tools now? Yeah, so that's that's been part of it. Um, 
I, I know I'm not supposed to do it, but I'll, I'll, I, I do need to say as a, a concrete example, um, we're, we're in beta of our Power BI extension where, for example, anybody doing Power BI, and maybe you don't have Power BI, but you have Tableau or something. Um, today, like it's easy for you to do bar charts or, or trend forecasting, things like that. And we just embed directly in. So you could just use SQL and then jump straight to uh, graph questions. And so you don't even have to write like any graph code. Uh, so that, that you couldn't do that uh, a few years ago. So what, uh, so Leah, so for uh, at that level of analysis, so what, what does, uh, what does graph analysis add? So in other words, I know what a bar chart is. I know what a pie chart is. I know what a histogram is. So, uh, give us some kind of, uh, uh, examples of where graph visuals really have made an impact. Yeah. So if we just, um, start on the, the visual side, um, there, there, I think we think of a few categories here. Um, some of the classic uh, connect the dot scenarios. So um, a lot of our work is like forensic where there's like a security or fraud incident. And what well, you might think about like, you know, physical people interacting, but often there's actually metadata in it. So like nowadays, like everyone's dealing with digital data. So for forensic, it might be as people are clicking around a website and maybe they're, you know, like, um, uh, like a bot ring trying to defraud your website. So, so that'd be on the forensic side. Um, you could do the same thing, for example, for money making. So that might look like on supply chain side, we get into a lot of big companies where they don't see their supply chain, they don't know their HR hierarchy. And that's a lot of, a lot of the connect the dot stuff. And then the other side, and I think more appropriate for this podcast is more the data science perspective where um, you might think, uh, one way of thinking about an edge in a graph is a correlation. And so are these two entities or these two samples correlated? And so, for example, most people who do data scientists, data science, they might do things like PCA, UMAP, TSNE, those things like that. But for example, the UMAP algorithm underneath is a simplex, like it's approximating a manifold. And if you look at it, the one simplex that it uses is actually edges in a graph. It's a K nearest neighbor. And more broadly, stepping like a 10,000 foot view, if you're looking at different correlations in a lot of really wide or a lot of disparate data sets, you want to really get those fuzzy correlations, that's that's graph. And then having visual tools, you know, early in your data process or whether you're reporting, that's actually not just the physical graph of, of people connected together, but it's actually weighted relationships that you're mining in your data and lets you actually reason about those. Um, so if you want to make machine learning interpretable, my one of my one of the things I'm seeing is graph is not the end all, but it's actually one of the more powerful tools for showing correlations. So one, one uh, thing about graph visualizations that sets it apart in my mind is that uh, uh, there's a high premium on uh, UX and, and interactivity. And by that, I mean, uh, you know, if you think about a typical uh, BI chart, uh, uh, bar chart, you know, done, here's a bar chart. But with graphs, <laughs> usually graphs involve a lot of nodes and edges, so you need to be able to navigate and inner and zoom in, zoom out, and so what is? Uh, are there new tools that make it easy? Because uh, uh, back in the day, there was a, you know there was a, the static. What what do you call that? The hairball, <laughs> the, the hairball <laughs> yeah. chart, right? So yeah, so, uh, the, so so the, now the, nowadays the, have uh, have the tools for navigating large char graphs improved? Like, I yeah, guess you, also, you guys are at the forefront of this, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, I'll get to that in a second. But I think one thing is, is useful to um, separate is like what part of the workflow we're in. So, if we're reporting, sometimes it is cool to have a big graph. So, like, we see a lot of folks, if you want to go viral, like, yeah, it's nice for marketing. Um, but if I was just going to put in a business report, um, I, would, I would probably actually just do a very simplified small graph because intuition might, might be small. So, for reporting, it's, it's more about getting there. Um, but for um, actual, like, let's say you're putting something, you know, like there's this question, like, is BI dead? Like, what, what is modern BI? Just giving somebody like a report and then they just ignore it. Like that, that's, that's actually what we don't want. Um, and so if we flip it around and think a bit more about exploratory data analysis, it's more useful for the person putting the data together, trying to understand it. Think of the dashboard as a tool, an interactive tool, being able to see the bigger stuff. Um, so we were kind of uh, first for kind of doing end-to-end -end GPU acceleration. So we could actually show a lot more data and more importantly, interact with it. Real-time clustering, real-time dimensionality reduction, real-time coloring. But then when you report, now all of a sudden, are you just doing a quick report? Let's say something in a PowerPoint. 
maybe it's a cool screenshot. Maybe you want to simplify a graph if you're actually trying to explain something, whatever. But then if you're actually doing giving something to an end user and they need to start answering their own questions based off of that dashboard, they could actually start answering questions interactively, like you know, drill down that things like that. That a bar chart, like you don't know what's in a bar of a bar chart, but if you have correlations in that data around the entities, now you have an interactive tool to do it. Ho so by the way, uh, so, so you kind of uh, mentioned something in passing, which is very powerful. This notion of connect the dots, as as you as you noted, there's so many uh, situations where this matters, right? So logistics, fraud, uh, explainability, and machine learning, and things like that. So. Yes, so very powerful uh, and yet very simple to un understand concept in many ways. So let's go to uh, uh, one of the things we highlighted in the post is kind of the uh, rising interest in uh, graph neural networks and graph machine learning. And we also kind of uh, made sure to set expectations by saying, okay, so there's a lot of excitement, but the tools tend to be a little challenging at this point. Uh, you do still need some probably experts on your team in order to, oh, yeah. to, to, to forge ahead. But uh, so if, and in our post, uh, which I'm linking to the episode notes, we, we put so many good examples of people actually using this graph neural networks in production. Um, so if you were to kind of uh, explain to the audience the actual current state of the tools and where do you think the tools will be in one to two years? Yeah, um, then I, I think actually what you're bringing up about the use cases might be good to, to drill in on those because I think not everybody knows where they're being used. Um, yeah, so the state of, of the tools. Um, so <laughs> for me, uh, it's... Uh, um, our, our, the way we got into this is out of frustration. Um, and, and so I think that that might be a, a good understanding. Um, so we were uh, doing some misinformation analysis of like, how do we use a bunch of AI models to automatically detect and, under, and trace and understand uh, mis medical misinformation for obvious reasons. And we like low code, no code, automatic, you know, auto ML, auto visualization, all this stuff. And then what we, <laughs> when we were looking around all the graph neural network stuff, you know, I, I love DGL, I love PyTorch, but uh, oh my gosh, uh, that was uh, night and day from what we do for actual, you know, it's not how you work quickly. That, that stuff you measure in months, maybe if you're an expert you know, in, in weeks, while the normal stuff is, is what we, we try to do same day. And so our, our goal is actually to get it to, to the same day stuff. And, uh, and so um, at, at this point, uh, how far away from are we from uh, that vision? We're, we're actually close. So um, credit where credit's due. I, I really love for the stuff under the hood that Amazon and NVIDIA are doing it for DGL to just make it scale. And so you can actually put in heterogeneous data sets on, on big ones. We should get into that, but to make it underneath. But the man, is that API rough? And then if, if you're like someone who's just in like, again, like you're in like Tableau or you're just in a, in a Jupyter notebook and you're just, you just got a data set you want to crank through, um, they are not set up for that. Um, so we're, we're actually working on Pygraphist Street. Um, I, I don't know when this uh, podcast airs, but um, we have an AI branch there that we've been working on just making that kind of how you might just do like, you know, a dot umap dot plot or just a bar chart dot plot. We're trying to get a lot of this stuff to, uh, to that level. So I'll put you on the spot. Let's say I invite you to give a keynote at a conference and I give you I give you three slides to get people excited about graph neural networks. And in each slide, you have a use case. So what are these three slides going to be? Yeah, so I think um, the one that's probably earliest ahead is um, how we do uh, chemistry and biology. So the AlphaFold uh, team over at Google uh, from, I think I got a deep mind. They basically, um, a, a few years ago now, they basically trumped everybody on, on protein folding uh, prediction for a kind of drug interaction. So this, if you want to make precision medicine or a synthetic um, fuel, this is like one of the Lego blocks. They trumped everybody. And then uh, the year after, like they, they got, they basically not only like doubled over everybody, they actually hit the sort of the, the, I don't know, 10, 20 year long challenge limit. So they're basically now lots of PhDs are just dropping what they're doing for years just to, to do it this way. Um, the next is uh, I think um, kind of the security fraud space when we're, we're trying to do detection of uh, and classification of, of basically 
bad guys, or if in finance world, you can actually flip around and say if the good guys, you know, um, <laughs> uh, both are interesting. Um, there, uh, as kind of, I was mentioning with misinformation, um, it's, it's no accident that Twitter bought the startup of one of the leading uh, GNN researchers, because I'm sure the startup is doing great stuff, but they also meant that their head of the data Michael, science- Michael became, Bornstein. Right. Yes, exactly. It's amazing. Uh, you should look at his keynote, like not my keynote, right? <laughs> and uh, there, um, th really, misinformation, which is like text and text graph, um, fraud, uh, you know, ownership relationships, security, digital data. Um, I think a, a lot of those core problems where we might have done graph analytics before, we might have done traditional machine learning before, now we could put them together. And then uh, last one, this is a little more speculative, but um, I'll actually give like two. Uh, so the one that's non-speculative is recommendations. Graphs used to be the way that we do recommendations, like, you know, cosine similarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the early days of, rec right? So in the early days of data science. And then yeah, and, and so now, now, now it's back because you can use that structure plus traditional machine learning, put them together. And that's why folks like Pinterest sort of led the way, but now others are doing. Now, on our side, what we're actually seeing a lot of customer activity on um, is um, uh, supply chain. The reason that is, is, you know, we can talk about it later but more, but the intuition is, for example, people doing map ETAs like Google Maps, they actually use graph neural networks now to figure out, hey, out of all the paths ahead of you, if you go this way, you'll go this, take, take this long. And, you know, that's why you want that path. Um, supply chain is actually a lot of similar stuff. Um, it, it is different, but at a high level, if you want to do, instead of optimizing on time, you want to optimize, let's say, on the cost of goods and which path to get there. At a fuzzy intuition, like you can actually do a lot of that similar reasoning. The reality is there's actually, a give a different technical explanation, but at 10,000 foot, uh, you, you can squint and, and that gives you some of that. In, in our post, we also cited something uh... Uh, in this general area uh, around uh, DeepMind using graph neural networks to help uh, uh, Google Maps and, and estimated time of arrival, I believe. I'm sorry, I missed that. Zoom was uh, having a bit of fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in our post, I think we cited a related example around Google Maps and DeepMind uh, using graph neural networks to improve uh, estimated time of arrival predictions. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yes, um, um, Google Maps is doing it. Other other mapping companies are doing it too. Um, I think uh, definitely in China, we're seeing a bunch. So another insight in the post, which I would label the most controversial insight, is uh, around getting started. And uh, Leo, as Leo points out, uh, it turns out that for most companies, you may not need a graph database to get started. So apologies in advance to our mutual friends in the graph database space, but uh, uh, we're just uh, kind of making an observation here that uh, seems to be borne out in practice. Yeah, so that's, um, I, you know, for all our, like we partner with like all the <laughs> graph databases at this point, or at least all the big ones. And so, uh, I'm definitely not saying they're bad. Like we have customers together and they're pretty happy. Um, and we're actually going new frontiers. But I, I think um, getting back to the original part of the discussion about just the ease of use, um, we're seeing this both like both for the graph, um, the advanced visual analytics side, but also the, the AI side. So for visual analytics, like if you have a CSV, an Excel file, a SQL database, like a data frame and a notebook, you could immediately start visualizing it. Like there's no reason to save that to disk and, and do all this other stuff. Um, on the AI side, when you're doing a neural network framework, we're, we're see, uh, seeing the same thing. And um, I think-, uh, I think Actually, I actually the, uh, uh, Leo, on the AI side, there's an even more uh, important observation in the sense that uh, even if you use a graph database, once you do AI, you'd still need a, a separate package to do the machine yes. anyway. So. So you're, you're really, in essence, don't really need a graph database at all. Yeah, like the, the internals of the neural network is going to be so different from how a graph database is built that it's, it's just, it's not like you probably won't even run on the same hardware. And so it's, it's uh, what we're seeing is for the graph database companies. I think like Neo4j tried to reinvent it all using CPU stuff, but you know, that's actually a hard research problem to beat GPUs using CPUs. While in reality for most neural networks, that stuff is GPU nowadays. And we had this quote that I, that I loved, which was, you don't need a graph database. None of Meituan's 30 graph neural networks use one. And, and I love that case because um, uh, you can, it's actually like a talk and those are Those are production, those are production graph neural yeah. networks. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So like this is a company that, you know, it's, they're not afraid of graph, of graph databases. They have a knowledge graph powering some of their stuff, but then um, they actually built a graph neural network team that's powering, and I don't know, like 10 different uh, business units, uh, five, 10 different business units with all sorts of graph neural networks. None of those uh, use a, use uh, the, the graph database because if you think of the pipeline, they have a modern data stack. They have like, I don't know, it's like a data lake or like a, like a warehouse that's all structured and already cleaned up. They, they, you know, you can do parquet or whatever to actually go at a much bigger rates than a traditional graph database would. And you know, you don't want to drink through a straw. And then once you have that big, big stuff, if you're going to do ECL, you're going to use stuff like Spark, right? And then when you're actually going to do the learning, you're going to do that on the GPU framework. So like, if you you could add a graph database there. So I'm not saying they're bad. And like, actually, maybe you know, half a year later, there might be a use case that pops up that you want to do real time something or other, but when you're actually doing the core data science in the beginning, like there's, it's actually more of a distraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually uh, a related insight that we have is this rise of this modern data platform, the cloud lake houses and warehouses that separate storage and compute allow you to yeah. do something in between the two things that we just discussed, which is the graph, graph visualization and BI graph machine learning, but what if you're starting to do graph analytics and massive graph queries? As Leah points out, you can actually use these modern data platforms to answer graph questions on large graphs now. Yeah, so this is uh, early days. If, if I was going to put my investor hat on. Um, if you do have a cool startup, let me know. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but if I was going to put my investor hat on, this is actually an interesting gap going on where um, I think the, the definitely graph neural networks is probably the bigger thing. But um, today, when I observe a lot of our customers, um, they'll use things like for the ETL step, for the data preparation, they'll use stuff like Spark or Redshift or Snowflake. Um, but sometimes some of that preparation step should do graph stuff. And then sometimes you do, you do have some questions. And today it is easier to do graph databases in general, just because it's already set up for, for multi-node. But the reality is you don't actually want that stuff to be persistent. You'd rather just have a compute tier thing, just as how like Spark, the reason Spark exists is like you have your data, your, your storage elsewhere. Um, we are seeing uh, startups appear here. So I think in the article we mentioned, for example, Travaris, um, which does it at the, which does the CPU uh, horizontal and I think both horizontal and vertical at this point. Um, with, but you could do stateless, pass in your data frame and do whatever cipher query, no, no reason to persist it. Um, so that I think, uh, but it's still early days for that. So I'm, I'm looking for an open source company to kind of really fill that gap. But there are like, for example, Travaris has a free tier for, I think for kind of smaller graphs, like four core or whatever. So this is a question I asked you uh, while we were writing the post, but uh, is, there, uh, is there the equivalent of SQL for graphs that uh, a clear standard? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm torn on this. So um, the original cipher that came from the Neo4j teams has to date, um, like I think there might be like a standard like open cipher or something. Um, that has definitely been the most approachable we see for our users. Um, and that's really good for kind of search tasks. And then on the other side, we see folks gravitate for more compute tasks to something more of the pre style model. So for example, Tiger Graphs uh, G-SQL was essentially uh, like, a, like a rewrite of that. Um, but in and, and there is a standard community called G-SQL, which is trying to combine some of these ideas. Um, the issue is like G-SQL, um, especially the pre stuff, um, I've just basically seen customer after customer has been unable to do it in practice. So it's normally a sales engineer doing that stuff like for you, which maybe you can afford. But um, like, so I think uh, Cypher is definitely in all the Cypher stuff we're excited about, but it's been harder uh, to do more of the compute stuff. So I think that, I hope that question is, I hope people do not believe they've answered it because observationally that we're in a bad spot if, they, if that's where we are as the end point. So I think another, another I think uh, very helpful thing we did in the post is we laid out a, a stack, a graph intelligence stack. Uh, and there you can see, uh, I mean, uh, we added both vector databases and, and graph databases. Uh, we, we made them optional. <laughs> <laughs> we made them. <laughs> we made them optional. So, so what's uh, have you heard? Have you heard from your graph uh, peers about this uh, uh, graph intelligence stack diagram? So, what's the reaction been to the uh, graph intelligence stack? Uh, some of them pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> 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 Very carefully uh, trying to uh, 
not pay attention to what their customers are doing or saying that they they're doing no, no, it but all this, wrong. Uh, this uh, graph intelligence stack is, uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, very realistic for what what you can do then, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. And this is uh, what we're seeing, uh, like in our own projects. Like sometimes we do a graph database, but like maybe for every graph database project, we have like five or ten that are not a graph database. So it's it's just where we are. Like the main, again, the Meituan quote, like hit it. And then, um, and then, Leah, for for the folks out there who are not familiar, vector databases are are even newer, and they they tend to be uh, uh, optional on the ML side as well, right? So, yeah. So, so going back to the beginning conversation when I was talking about graph as uh, kind of for for AI and machine learning, where it lets you talk about not like you know person A talk to person B, but like connect the dot, but also fuzzy relationships, like we mine this thing. What's going on there is. Um, both like like when we learn representations of entities, uh, like those are as vectors, and then when we want to compute on them, you know, compare to two vectors or guess if there's something out there, find find nearby ones, related ones, recommended ones. Those are now uh, vector computations. Uh, so that actually brings us back to GPUs. Actually, um, um, and part of why we don't use like like a lot of the CPU era stuff is less interesting, but um. What we're seeing with the vector databases, and um, again, <laughs> putting my investor hat on, I, I think we're seeing two things going on. Um, all the money is going in one of the directions, but um, there's this question of uh, when we're adding this ability to deal with fuzzy relationships and fuzzy data to our kind of correlational reasoning, um, the question is, do you need a database or do you need an index? And so what we're seeing is existing database vendors are like, hey, I could already do these other queries. Let me just add in some vector query support. And so we are seeing the graph database vendors put it in, but also, for example, Elasticsearch for, has a vector indexes now. Um, we, we are seeing big fundraises starting to happen for discrete vector databases. And so I think part of the question is going to be, I think, Vector databases is a standalone thing, especially for like a like a deep data science team. Probably there probably are cases that are going to be important there, um, but uh, at the same time, for a lot of the existing stuff, it might maybe your graph your data lake supports vend, uh, vector indices directly, or your compute tier. Um, so so well. for so for example, the uh, the graphic we have there where we have examples of graph neural networks, I I yeah. speculate that almost all of those don't use a vector database, right? Yeah, uh, those are all um, in memory, um, and this is in generally a graph neural, in general neural networks. The relationship with the database is uh, generally today it's more batch. There are some experimental papers that show extending a neural network with and having it being able to do a feedback loop with the database is valuable. That will be a vector database when that happens, right? right, right, right. But uh, you know, but, that but, today, even, but even even during the training phase, don't they probably do not use a. Yeah, because you're going to take all your, your data and you're going to you're going to have to feature encode it anyway, right? And yeah, so yeah. you're going to take a batch, you're encode because the GPU is not going to want your your weirdly looking database files. Oh, so by the way, I forgot to do this at the top of the post, but at uh, uh, the top of the episode, but uh, uh, we make a point in our post that uh, uh, the title of the post is graph intelligence, but there is a, a category that we have postponed addressing around NLP. So this, which includes knowledge graph. So, so just so you know, so just so the listeners know. And uh, Leah, a bit of an update on my part. I've uh, uh, our mutual friend Mike Tong, the CEO of uh, Diffbot, has given me oh. access to Diffbot. So I've been uh, I've been uh, enjoying uh, uh, using Diffbot uh, data for uh, my own uh, work and analysis. But yes, anyway. Yes, yes. Uh, so let's close this post by putting Leo on the spot. So we wrote the post. That was the state of the world in late 21, early 22. So now fast forward a year from then. So late 22, early 23. What are we looking at in terms of the graph intelligence landscape? I does, think, does, does, um... does, first of all, does the graph intelligence stack change? Substantially, or it just means that the, the different components get better, like the graph live graph neural network libraries get easier and so on and so forth. So first of all, the graph intelligence stat, does that change at all? Yeah, I think it's going to change uh, a couple of ways. And part of it's just broader um, AI trends where right now the whole feature store experiment database, like all like vector database, that, that ecosystem is a bunch of 
it's like a constellation of stuff that right now is a kind of annoying to have to string together. Um, I think, uh, and I'm hoping some of the bigger database vendors and probably imagine like a Databricks is just going to unify that into their platform. So you don't have to buy like a million and one tools, right? And once that comes in, the graph neural networks are going to have to go as part of it. Um, another part we're seeing early on, uh, um, and we're seeing, for example, like in the, part of the reason we do DGL uh, as one of our tools of choice is it's just more mature for the enterprise grade AI. And as an example, there is um, AutoML, you know, and kind of all the infrastructure you need for AutoML, um, which would hook into all those things we just talked about. Um, a lot of that is coming into play. Um, and uh, um, again, like the DGL community is just ahead of everyone else on that. But I, but I expect that to everywhere to be showing up more. Those probably infrastructure wise, like two of the biggest shifts. So, but are there, uh, so what about usability of GNMs in terms of, you know? So uh, for, yeah, so uh, I'm, for, I'm kind of rolling for, that into AutoML. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, so, is, so for example, yeah. in uh, in computer vision and in NLP, you have, you know, as, as, use, as user of those things, you have starting, you have starter models, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So we have these like, I don't know what they're called, like like universal models or whatever, yeah. like yeah, yeah. foundational models. I forgot what they're calling them now. Um, so I, I think we're going to see a couple, a, a few. So we're actually all about like the no code and low code making this stuff easy. That's that's kind of why we dug into this because we're like, this is too hard for us to do. Like how are our customers going to do it? So we need to make it easier for them. So um, there are a few dimensions here. I think the, the academic community has been solving a lot of it in terms of supporting heterogeneity in data. So just like the core model itself, like ignoring the pre-trained, just could it deal with heterogeneity? Could it deal with scale? Um, we're currently also in a, in a phase of just doing a lot more automation of just kind of imagine model search. Um, so a lot of that's coming together. Um, the, a lot of the theory has been kind of for a lot of popular cases has been kind of coming together. And so we're starting to, that's starting to come into the, the tools you can actually use in, in an afternoon. I think, I hope, I hope um, some uh, of these universal models, which will come pre-trained for, imagine like misinformation, imagine for certain kinds of fraud. I think that's actually doable. Um, I, it's kind of a research thing right now. Um, that's the type of thing I'd, I'd be happy to do with like our customers, but that's that's kind of a... You know, like the equivalent of a model hub or, uh, yeah. you know, the uh, uh, like a directory of models that you can start with, right? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're actually talking to, well, it's more than that. So like for yeah. one side, it's like with Hugging Face, like we're talking about like, can we put in um, generic models and can we put in pre-trained models that you can just use? Yeah. But the other part of it is- um, But uh, ultimately you will, you might have to fine tune it, right? So yeah, that, there that's should the interesting still be, part. So like in NLP, right? So you've NLP, you have all these model hubs. Yeah, I can choose all sorts yeah. of models I can start with, but I need tools to help me fine tune it for my data. Right, so. Yeah, and I think that's even more important here. And this is actually part of the appeal of graph to us is that when we're dealing with business data, so the stuff in your SQL database, you might have customer, like a column of customer reviews in your, in your SQL database. But what you're going to have a lot of is like customer transactions, customer payments, like um, them clicking around your website. There's a lot more structured stuff. And, and so what that means is that as a business, if you look at every BU, they're going to have a lot of this structured data already in their data lake. So I actually think that uh, for graph neural networks, and especially those kind of more broad day-to-day -day business stuff that's supposed to be used for, like it's cool we could find like pictures of cats and videos, but I don't really need to integrate that with my accounts database, right? But um, if we're looking at like predicting which customer is going to you know, give more revenue or which customer is going to be high risk, now I really want to integrate that with all my data. And so I think doing AutoML, not at the pre-trained model level, but at the letting you retrain it with your actual uh, on like your actual database that's going to be much more important yeah 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 some kind of uh, some some notion of transfer learning for your data right um, yeah and like with, with stuff like dbt so much easier nowadays to get that data so we have so we talked about uh, the future of graph neural networks which uh, you know uh, addresses the needs of data scientists and ml engineers so on the analyst side um, at what point do you think a year from now it'll become more routine uh, for an analyst to be presenting their decision maker with graph with graph analysis? You know, you know what I mean. So part of it is a you have to have tools for the analyst. That's one thing, but the the person absorbing the information has to be comfortable absorbing the information in that form, right? So they're comfortable absorbing information in the form of traditional charts right now, right? So. 
Wait, so I'm sorry. I'm, I think I, so, I lost. So, 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 so you've got, so, so in the analyst side, right? So the analyst yeah. can produce cool graph visualizations and things like that, but they still need to somehow educate their decision maker. They don't yeah. have to do that for bar charts and, and traditional right. charts, right? So, so do you think a year from now, it'll become more routine for kind of the consumer of the information to understand kind mm. of graphs and, and maybe, 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 if, uh, maybe if the tools are optimized for this kind of connect yeah. the dot, connect, connecting the dot kind of scenarios. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think um, like if we divide, um, it's useful to like carve this stuff out. Like sometimes the best visualizations is no visualization. So if something could just deal with a yes or no answer, like let's not like, you know, yeah. let's not waste our time, right? But um, when, when places people are trying to visually understand what is going on, um, then yeah, I think making tools like, if we, I think uh, when, when we work with, a, with an organization, um, there's sort of like a maturity path we see there. So early on, it's just really direct physical representations of the data. So, um, and that's generally more accessible. And so if you make it easier, uh, and that's why we're doing this stuff like the Power BI stuff. Yeah, like that's that's generally the entry point. Oh, I can see my, like I'm trying to map out my assets. Here's the hierarchy of assets. Um, when you get into more operational analysts, like I, I don't think we really need to show machine learning data to like, you know, VPs, right? Yeah, yeah. But when we're working with operational analysts, what, as these tools become point, more point and click, I would never start them on something like a UMAP visualization. But if, uh, if I started with them with a direct investigation and then, hey, there's also a tab that lets you do, see the correlations more fuzzily, that's, that's actually more of the pathway we, we're seeing happen. Interesting, interesting. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I will link to the uh, post in the episode notes. And uh, in that post, there's a bunch of free tools from Graphistry. And by the way, uh, one, one thing I mentioned in the post was the Power BI integration, which was did not exist at the time of the post. So if you have a link for that, I will update the post to, to point awesome. to, the, to the Power BI integration. So, And with that, yeah. thank you, Leah. Yeah, and then I guess uh, one of the things I should highlight for folks um, on, on that thread is uh, we do have a, a PyGraphistry repo. So um, there you can do free GPU accelerated visual graph analytics just so you can see this stuff. But um, there's, uh, I don't know if it'll be landed by then. So it's either under the Graph AI branch or it might be mainline. But that were the, there, um, I think, two interesting things for, for more of the, the hands on folks of this podcast. One is the auto UMAP, where if you have a bunch of whatever the tape like document of like, maybe put posts on a forum with people and text and all that stuff. Um, the auto UMAP will kind of show you the, um, with that GPU acceleration for the viz and the compute, let you see those similarities and connections in the data. We've even run on stuff like stock market indexes. It's really cool to autom automatically map that stuff without the usual twiddling. And uh, kind of the newer part, like as that's landing, we've been switching to starting to bring out automatic uh, um, graph neural network support as well to bring it to that same. Our goal is like, we do it in five lines. So, so but those should, will be on the high graph history. You should have an example involving uh, the blockchain, right? So. Oh, we did. We ran it on the top 1000 uh, uh, cryptocurrencies actually to map out. Like it was really cool seeing like, for example, uh, Tether, there's this question of if like Bitcoin, we kind of know what Bitcoin, and Ethereum, and kind of how they're no, no, but the, you know the, the ledger, the ledger itself to help people trace, you know, whether yeah, or not yeah. I, I should be receiving, should I be receiving money from from uh, oh, this, yeah, yeah. from this account? Oh no, it's a uh, it's a uh, money launderers, right? <laughs> yeah, we we that that we do on the commercial side. We have customers that bring government or whatever doing that stuff. But the the crypto thing was fun because it was uh, it's actually a supply chain thing where. Let's say you want, but you're trying to. Let's say you're trying to invest in crypto, and you want to pick like, should I invest in Ethereum, Bitcoin, or Tether, or and then maybe these ten other things that just showed up on my Coinbase page or whatever, right? The question is, which of those are sort of correlated together, which link together? If you look at the day over day price I movements, see. you want to diversify or consolidate. Like, what if you want all the stable ones? And then, for example, if you think Tether is, uh, you might think Tether is fraudulent because there's rumors that they just print coins behind the scenes which ones are pegged to actually following Tether. And we were actually able to run it through the auto UMAP. We just, and I don't know, it was like a hundred line notebook. We just ran through all the Yahoo indexes of all the cryptocurrencies and we actually mapped out the entire ecosystem. It's pretty cool. So is it updated? Uh, yeah, we could do it every day. Yeah, it's easy. 
I see. Very cool. So maybe, maybe uh, if you, I don't know if uh, we could pull, open up your uh, investment portfolio after the call. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, Leo. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Always a pleasure.